Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. Verse 24, Colossians chapter 1. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now, I'm going to sound like a broken record. What's a record? It's a flat thing we used to listen to the music on. (laughs) Yeah, I used to listen to it when I was a kid. But anyway, I talked to you before about Paul beginning Colossians with his long sentence of 218 words and how... Greek is different than English. We have run-on sentences. They didn't think that way. And so what, what Paul would do is he would pile one word on top of another to make the idea more intense. And he finishes that long sentence, and he does it again immediately in Colossians chapter 1. We have here a sentence that the NIV translates with five sentences in English. That's how long the sentence was. And what Paul does in that long sentence is... Again, he brings out some very complex and deep and difficult ideas, piling one word on top of another to make what he's talking about more intense. And what he uses as the center of what he's talking about is two different uses of the same word, word fill or full. And so all this is organized around the use of those two words. And so let's talk about the first one. And I'm going to shake you up a little bit. If you think about this and you, don't, you take it out of context and don't deal with it directly, it can shake you up somewhat. But the work of Christ is not finished. Paul said, I am working really hard to fill up in my body what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I'm doing this for your benefit, church, so that the church can grow and the gospel can spread. And I am trying to fill up in my body what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, it's sort of like uh, somebody gives you a, a quart jar to fill up. You know, 32 ounces. And you go to put water in it, and it's not full until the jar is overflowing. I think the word there can be understood as more like complete. So Paul is saying, I'm trying to complete the work of Jesus with my own suffering. Now, because we human beings are the way we are, we take things and we twist them and we turn them. And we don't get them the way they were originally intended. And that has happened here with this this idea about filling up in my body, Paul said, what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. There have been thousands of pages of philosophy and theological works, scholarly works written about what Paul meant when he said, fill up in my body Christ's afflictions. Some are taking it this way that when Jesus did his work on the cross, that that wasn't enough for our salvation. That we have to keep on working. So at least in part, our place with God is partly earned. That we have to have some kind of merit. You know, that's that's a gift given or an award given based on what we have accomplished or done. I have to make it right with God by some kind of merit of my own. My father had this problem. He got saved at 37. And uh, I uh, saw him change from being a very angry, depressed, sometimes violent man to being a whole different kind of person. So I've got no doubts about his salvation. I mean, the Holy Spirit worked on him. But for years after his experience with Jesus, he struggled with this idea of grace and the idea that he could be forgiven just for what Jesus did. Right after I got married... Uh, right before we went to seminary, so we left in August of 1974 to go to seminary. Uh, it was, we left the same day Richard Nixon resigned. What a day, huh, you know? And uh, we lived with my mom and dad for about two months. We left our little apartment we were living in, lived with them for two months. And, and dad and I were sitting in the living room at night and talking about God. 
And he said to me, Ernie, I just can't believe it's that easy. That I just believe in Jesus. I don't have to be good or do something else. And so my, my dad was struggling with that. And so people take this, this, these verses and they talk about Christ's afflictions and Paul was still working to fill them up and it wasn't yet complete. And they misunderstand it and understand it as being that we still have to do good things to be right with God. But I want you to hear this. Remember, when Jesus died, his last words were, it is finished. Now, that's a translation, and it's a good translation, but it's not the best translation. The best translation is paid in full. Our Lord, the last thing he said was, all the sin of everyone who's ever lived has been paid in full. And so Paul was not talking about Jesus' death on the cross. In fact, the word afflictions is never used about Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But Jesus had more suffering than just what he went through on, on, on the cross for us. Remember what Matthew 8 says when Jesus responded to someone saying to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. He said, well, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Our Lord had no place to live, he traveled day after day after day for all of his life. He never knew where his next meal was coming from. He faced down Satan in the wilderness and in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And the last day of his life, he was beaten and tortured to within an inch of de death itself. Our Lord went through a lot more than just what he went through on the cross for our sins. And he did it because he was working to bring the truth of the gospel into the world. It was always God's plan for Jesus not to finish the work of the gospel going into the world, but to hand it off to his church. He called us to be his people. I will build on this rock of faith my church. And then as he left the earth, the last thing he did before he left was, whether your great commission is found in Matthew 28 or Acts chapter 1, he said, you go out. You make disciples of the nations. You be my witnesses to the farthest most parts of the world. And so the word that Christ began, he then hands over to the church. Remember what Paul says earlier in Colossians chapter 1? We are his body. He is our head. And now he works in the world through his body. This is always how Paul saw his work as an apostle, as someone sent out by God. He's on the way to Damascus. He sees Jesus. And I'm, I'm doing a very loose paraphrase here. Jesus says to Paul, why don't you stop killing Christians and start birthing Christians? And so Paul at one moment went away from killing Christians to being the one who spread the gospel and saw churches started and some people get saved. And so he goes back from that experience on the road to Damascus to a house in Damascus. And he's there blind from the experience. And God sends a, a, a godly man called Ananias to see Paul, and, and God says, tells Ananias, you go to Paul and you tell him, are you listening now, how much he has to suffer for my sake. And so Paul saw his life from that moment on as being an experience of suffering for the gospel. As he writes Colossians, Paul is in a Roman prison cell in the city of Rome. He thinks he's facing execution. And Paul was seeing what he was going through is being suffering for Christ for the purpose of making up afflictions not yet experienced so the work could continue. I want to see some recognition. You know, I, this is not a message about suffering. But we need to see suffering a way differently than we see it. When we talk about suffering, we talk about pain, torture, and anguish. Look what I go through. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But instead we should see it as being sacred. What God has given us to do for the cause of Christ in the world. Not only does it grow us as believers, but it also makes the church grow. And so we suffer for the sake of Christ. It's sacred. Just this week I was watching, and you won't see this in the mainstream media because the media doesn't care about things like this, but I was watching bands of Islamic marauders, fundamentalists, going through the streets of Pakistan, burning churches and pulling Christians out in the street and beating them to death. Now what we go through in America, in the American church, is nowhere near that. 
What those believers in Pakistan are doing is sacred and it's furthering the cause of Christ. And whatever you do, whatever you give, however you sacrifice, with your time, your talent, your money, your resources, whoever you are, God takes those sufferings and he uses it to grow God's church. Now, you know I'm not really much into the rock music, popular music, rhythm music. I'm a, cla- I'm a classical music fan. And you know, I tell people that, and I, I tell them reluctantly because people get, actually get angry at me if I say it. Isn't <laughs> it funny? You like classical music, huh? Well, you know, I do. But occasionally a song will catch me. And this song is a man, by a man named Dan Fogelberg. He's been dead for a while now. He died at 57 of cancer. Very sad and... He wrote this song early in his his life about his father, who at that time was dying. And it's it's meant as a tribute to his dad. Whenever I hear it, I think about Jesus and about my own life as I live for Jesus, well, I try to live for Jesus. It's called The Leader of the Band. How many of you ever heard of Dan Fogelberg? Yay! I fell alone for a moment. How many of you have ever heard The Leader of the Band? Isn't that a wonderful song? Let me read to you part of one verse, and, or the first verse, I should say, and then the refrain at the end. And I said, let me say it again, this is about Dan's dad, but it's, when I hear it, I think about Jesus. An only child alone and wild, a cabinet maker's son. His hands were meant for different work, and his heart was known to none. He left his home and went his lone and solitary way, and he gave to me a gift I know I can never repay. The leader of the band is tired and his eyes are growing old, but his blood runs through my instrument and his song is in my soul. My life has been a poor attempt to imitate the man. I'm just a living legacy to the leader of the band. And I think about myself and and, and my attempts to make up in my life the afflictions. And I'm just a poor attempt to imitate the man Jesus. But you know... Everything I am is from Him. And when I serve Him, it's Him living through me. We're following the leader of the band. I thought about singing it for you. But I knew the vote would be no. (laughs) Now, I told you that this text is centered around two uses of the word full or completeness. And here's the second use of the word. Paul says that our work for Christ is centered on preaching the word of God in all its fullness, all of its completeness. We preach the Old Testament and the New Testament. We take all of its ideas about the gospel and we make them known. We are centered on the fullness of the word of God. All we are about is what the word of God says. And when the word of God does not say it, we have nothing to say. I listen to to a great deal of preaching. I like preaching. I enjoy preaching. And uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm going to be really honest about this. I I hear a great many modern preachers read the Word. Some of them don't read the Word at all when they preach. And then they read the Word, they use it as an excuse to make whatever comments they have to make, what they think they have to say. And the Word of God is forgotten. And I was reading a, a survey recently from the Barner Group. The Barner Group is, a, is probably the leading Christian Poland organization. And um, they discovered some very interesting and, and I think frightening things that over one-third of evangelical pastors do not believe that the Word of God, or what we call the Word of God, is actually the Word of God. That it's still full of error and all kinds of things that the early church put in, but it's not actually the Word of God. And and over one-third of Christian pastors don't believe some of the great fundamentals of our faith, things that we know to be true. And what has happened is that across Christianity right now, pastors and churches meet on Sundays, and they don't care at all about the fullness of the Word of God. They talk about other things. And politics and wokeness have entered our churches and we've lost America. This is why we've lost America. Because we do not preach and believe in the fullness of the Word of God. Paul said, this is what I'm about. This is what my sufferings are for. 
This is what I trust in. That we should preach the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Gospel and every detail and everything because all of our truth comes from the Word of God. I'm going to talk about myself for a moment. Is that okay? I don't mean to make myself the center of this. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm not very much. And, but um, there's something I really believe in a lot. I believe that, I, that God called me and He wants me to preach. And there are men who are better looking than me. Don't say amen. <laughs> there are men who have much better voices than I do. Men who are much more skilled and gifted than I am. Certainly there are a lot, more, a lot of men with much better hair than I have. <laughs> and so I'm not, I'm not trying to fool myself about my abilities and who I am. But you know, I, my, my, my brother-in-law Chan, I love my brother-in-law Chan, and my wife and I would go see him and Sandra. They both passed away in the last year. In fact, last time we saw him, he died a week later, uh, suddenly. But he worked till he was about 80. And he always thought he should retire earlier. So every time I saw Chan, he would say the same thing to me. Ernie, when are you going to retire? You know, this doesn't last forever. I said, Chan, why should a man in his early 50s retire? I said, Chan, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll retire when the present is younger than me. <laughs> okay. And so every time we went before we go see Chan, I, I would turn to Debbie and say the same thing. It's time for me to go here that I'm going to die and I should retire. And so I, finally I, you know, I, I, I talked to him about it. I said, Chan, listen. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it, this is hard to understand for people who have nine to five jobs, you know, and but I don't really have a job. I don't, this is not what I do for a living. Just like Paul, you know, every preacher should feel called and feel responsible for making the Word of God known. And th this is just what I do. And, you know, I don't think I can retire from this. And if I did retire, I'd probably go out to the dismal swamp and preach to the alligators. And they wouldn't laugh either. This, this is what we do. It's what our call is. It's what we are about. We preach the Word of God in all of its fullness. Because we believe in the power of the Word of God to change lives and for people to be saved. And Paul said, I make up in my life the things that Christ has not yet finished. And how I do it is I preach the Word of God in all of its fullness. And the Word of God changes people. And here is what he said about the heart of his preaching. I think it is the gospel in miniature, the gospel in a nutshell. It is the clearest, most succinct, precise presentation of the gospel that I know of. He said this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he used that word Christ intentionally. He meant to say by using Christ that this is God's plan throughout all the years. He had it prophesied to us by the great men of the Old Testament. And then when Christ was born, He fulfilled that prophecy. He is the anointed, chosen one of God. And when you believe in Him, He comes in you and lives in you. So His life flows through you. He is hope. Now we talked very extensively about this recently on several occasions. Remember, New Testament hope is not a wish. It's a guarantee from God, which is what we're looking forward to having become a reality one day, and it will happen. That He is our hope of eternal life. That He is the hope of glory. And anyone, anyone can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. If someone ask you, what do you believe as a Christian? You don't have... A, Time to do the whole New Testament. You say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus came to answer prophecy. He's my Savior. He lives inside of me. And He's given me a promise that I have eternal life. That's what, that's what our faith is all about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now Paul says that this message is a mystery that was not known. Now let's stop for a moment. We talked about mystery very extensively. Let me remind you we talked about Mystery is something God knows that we don't know. But the only way we do know it is that He chooses to reveal it to us. He pulls back the curtain and we could see it. 
Paul says, listen, what happened to Jesus is he pulled back the curtain and we could see it was always God's plan. It was always the mystery that he would make us right with him through Jesus. Now, we have the responsibility of making it known to the world. Are you listening? Are you listening? This is very important. There are things that God knows that we don't know. He hasn't revealed them to us yet. There are things the church knows that the world doesn't know because He has revealed them to us. And there are things the church knows that the world will never know unless we tell them. That's the work that Paul was giving up his life for. That's why he was going through the afflictions he was going through, the suffering he was going through. It's why we go through the suffering we go through so that the world can through us know Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Now, I, I uh, put this on Facebook, uh, church Facebook page. The people who do our, our, uh, our uh, online media, they told me at staff meeting, you should post at least once a month something. Whenever you post, people actually pay attention. <laughs> okay. And so I've been trying to post something once a month. And this past Monday, uh, you know, Cal got a, 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 a birthday gift to play at the Golden Horseshoe which is the golf course in Williamsburg. It's a great history to the Golden Horseshoe. I remember when it was built when I was a little kid, and I, I remember people talking about that. You know, I love golf. I'm, I play golf, and uh, I enjoy golf very much. But I never played the Golden Horseshoe. I didn't even know where it was. This is, a, this is what I'm talking about right now. I didn't even know where it was. And so I put into my navigation system, Golden Horseshoe, and I get the directions, and, I, and I'm taking it. I got my whole family in tow, you know, in the van. We're driving the Golden Horseshoe. And uh, it's taking me to downtown we Colonial Williamsburg, right into the heart of, of Colonial Williamsburg. I'm thinking to myself, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I, the, the navigation system's incorrect, you know? And it takes me right to the Williamsburg Inn, and, and it turns out the Golden Horseshoe, the first tee, is right behind the Williamsburg Inn. Now, I want you to hear something about this. I'm a Virginian. I studied Williamsburg history in the, in the, in the uh, colonial, colonial history of Virginia. I can't talk. I got stuck all of a sudden. I studied Colonial Williamsburg when I was in the fourth grade, when I was in the sixth grade. It was required of all kids in school to do this. And I, I, they, in fifth grade, they took us to Colonial Williamsburg. I went there the first time. I got a little horseshoe with my name on it. I still have the horseshoe. My wife and I have gone to Colonial Williamsburg all through our marriage. Every fall, we go there, and the leaves are changing. We eat at a nice restaurant. We walk all around the place. I have been up and down Duke of Colossus Street hundreds of times. I've been to the powder magazine right there on Duke of Gloucester Street. Does anybody have any recognition I'm talking about? You ever been there? Yes, Pastor. And I had no idea that about 100 yards from the powder magazine was the first tee of the Golden Horseshoe. And this golf course is two, it's 36 holes. It's hundreds of acres all through Colonial Williamsburg. I never knew. I never knew. I never, I never, I was absolutely shocked by this. I can see that nobody else is, but I was shocked. And I turned to my wife and said, honey, am I, is this a parallel universe? Did I go through a wormhole or something? I mean, I've been here all my life. I've never seen the golf course. I never knew it was here. <laughs> and it's the most beautiful golf course I've ever seen. It is extremely hilly. You have these great vistas across valleys, and you see golf, golf course stretched out in front of you. There are, there are holes below you on the other side of rivers. There are holes above you that, uh, behind great big bunkers. It's just a gorgeous golf course, and it's also the hardest golf course I ever played. And I never knew it was there. It was a mystery to me. And no one ever told me. And I want you to hear, hear this. I want you to hear this. That just... On the other side of a word from you is a great mystery. There's great beauty. There are people you know who need to hear Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that powerful? It's right there. And you can tell them. Now, I'm going to tell you a joke. It's not a, big, it's not a funny joke. I think it's funny, but not real funny. I told at the early service, they laugh. So you've got a big responsibility, you know. And if you don't think it's funny, Pretend. Pretend to laugh. Bubba goes over to his friend Billy Bob's house, and, and Billy Bob's working on his car in the garage. Bubba said, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to fix the turn signal. Could you go outside of the car and look at it and, as I push the button, see if it's, it's working? 
And he says, okay. He's, Philip, Bob is standing there, and Philip Bob goes, uh, is, is it working? And Bubba goes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, are you listening now? The gospel is always a yes and never a no. I want you to hear this. That people need to hear from the church, not a no, that we don't really believe what we say we believe. The Bible's not really God's word. Those stories really aren't true. Salvation is something different than what you thought it was. Instead, you need to hear the word of God in all of its fullness. And that for all the world, it's a yes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are praying now that we can understand what it means to make up in our bodies Christ's afflictions, that the work is not complete. And he gave to his church the responsibility of making it complete. That's why we sacrifice. That's why we give. That's why we work. That's why we do all the things we do to complete the work that you gave us to do. And we center it on the fullness of the word of God, preached in all its power and beauty. We make it known to the world, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that simple message, no longer a mystery. The world can know the beauty that's waiting just for them on the other side of faith. Right now there are people who may be believing in this room, maybe watching online, maybe at the West Portsmouth campus. And I pray, Father, whoever that person is, they'll pray that, this prayer with me. Will you pray it with me? Pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray you'll forgive me because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And I pray you'll come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved. You pray that prayer with me. Let me know. We'll share with you more about how to follow through on your faith. Take the card and the chair. Take the form attached to the worship program. Talk to our online counselor that they're waiting for you. Leave that form at the Welcome Center or drop it in the offering box or hand it to me. And I promise you we will help you know more about your faith. Heavenly Father, we leave this place in a moment with the determination that we're going to complete the job that Jesus gave us to do. And we pray this now, Father, in his name. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.